Hello, my name is uh, Stephen Le Guil, and I will uh, discuss today sequencing of therapy for a patient with TP53 mutated mantle cell lymphoma. These are my disclosures. So here is the case. So it's a 52 years old male who have been diagnosed with mantle cell lymphoma. At initial diagnosis, he was presenting with bone marrow involvement, which means it was stage four, which is quite common for this type of disease. Uh, his MIPI score was uh, intermediate low. He cake 67 expression was positive. 30% of the cells. He was cyclin D1 positive. As you know, this is a standard for mantle cell lymphoma. He was not mutated, and more importantly, he had a TP53 mutation. He received a first line of treatment with ERDAP, so I dose RSC, followed by autologous stem cell transplant for consolidation and a rituximab maintenance. Unfortunately, the patient relapsed. So I want just to take a little time uh, up to uh, clarify the characteristic that that we know about this patient at diagnosed. The MIPI score, as you can see here on the right side of, of, the, of the slide, is a very good prognostic marker for patient outcome. It's stratified to different groups with patient having a low MIPI score and those who are having a high MIPI score and the overall survival is worse for those having a high MIPI score. As you can imagine, there's different kinds of MIPI, the bio MIPI, where you can add the K67 uh, uh, percentage of cells, but it, it, it's a quite robust and well-proved uh, scoring system that is usual in clinical trials, but not that often used for this medical decision in routine practice. But there are a, a lot of other markers that have been identified. And you can see here is, for example, those who are listed on the MD underscore scoring system. It's not only about, the, it's not about MIPI, it's about clinical and cytologic features of, of the tumor, like blastoid variant, TP3 statrid, or 7TP dilation, having complex karyotype is also a bad prognostic marker. MIC positivity, assessed by FISH, is also classified as a worse, as a bad prognostic marker in the MD Anderson's classification. Bulky tumor and KE67 percentage of the cells positive for KE67. So the, the question of prognostic marker at diagnosis in mantle cell lymphoma is, is a complex one because there are a lot of markers, but let's be honest, daily practice most of the time, we do not start uh, did we not decide the treatment based on this marker? But at uh, the time of relapse, I think it's important to have in mind what was the initial characteristic of the patient. But in this case here, we keep in mind that he has been transplanted, patient has been transplanted. It was TP3 stage two mutated at diagnosis. So we may expect that this patient have a worse outcome as compared to other patients. So all we will, what will be the guideline for our uh, medical decision? What, what patient's characteristics might influence the treatment choice by time of first relapse. I listed here three items. I think the duration of response after transplant is probably one of the most important uh, items you have to take into consideration before to take any medical decision. P53 status, but we know that this patient in particular was P53 mutated at diagnosis. And also having in mind some data, uh, what about the expectation of the duration of response after first, second, and third relapse? These are three major point that you need to know when you take your medical decision. So I want to illustrate this point. What about the duration of response? The, this is a, a, a work published by Carlo Visco in Leukemia this year, where uh, our, our Italian colleagues look at the outcome of the patient according to the duration of response to the first to the frontline treatment. And in particular, what happened to the patients who already have been transplanted? So this is a result of the so-called mental first uh, study. As you see here, the uh, patient who experienced an early progression after transplant, early being classified as relapse within two years after initial diagnosis, these patients are doing quite badly in terms of overall survival and PFS. And if you look at the treatment that this patient received, it looks like those who receive ibrutinib uh, at first relapse do better than the other one in terms of overall survival. It's not that clear in the curves of the PFS, but the message here, if you get ibrutinib, you probably do better than a bike or other chemotherapy treatment if you are, if the patient experiences an early relapse. And it's different if this is a late relapse. So these are patients having 
who unfortunately relapsed more than two years after diagnosis. There is, looks like there is no major difference uh, of, of, of overall survival or no PFS if you receive or not ibritinib. So the duration of response after transplant, good marker. What about TP53 mutation? Right, it's, it's well known that any kind of abnormality uh, in in the p53 genes is not a good signal whatever is a mutation or deletion and this is work that was done by our scandinavian colleagues clearly showed that if your p patient is uh, have a p53 mutation or deletion his outcomes even if you get transplanted will be worse than the other patients without p53 mutation it's true in overall survival pfs and of course incidence of relapse is higher in tp53 deleted or p53 mutated patient and if you combine tp53 deletion and mutation then you you can see here clearly that these patients don't have a good outcome even if they receive a transplantation frontline and if you combine different markers all together you see that the strong prognostic marker is mutation of tp53 so it's something we should more we should do at diagnosis or at least systematically at relapse in particular in the patients who are unfortunately will not enjoy the long duration of response so what do we expect in terms of response after first, second, and last relapse? This is what we call PFS2, PFS3, and PFS4. Still a work by our uh, Scandinavian colleagues. And it's clearly clearly shown here on the right slide of this cartoon that the longer overall survival in PFS is the first one. The duration of response of second, third, and fourth relapse is pretty much the same. And the overall survival is getting shorter and shorter over time and one relapsed after the other one. So the choice of treatment as for, at first relapse or even more at diagnosis are key decision in the medical history of the patient with mantis cell lymphoma. Is, is, is this is this kind of curve, this kind of data that uh, all clinicians should get in mind when, uh, when they are treated a patient with mantis cell lymphoma who relapse. So, Having in mind these different curves and these different prognostic markers, what are currently the treatment options that are available in daily practice? You can start again with a standard chemotherapy, usually bandamustin base if the patient did not receive bandamustin frontline, idosarese, the patient is probably, I will probably already really receive uh, idosarese frontline. Uh, so there are other kind of therapy most of the time, it's going to be our chop, GAP or RSE-based therapy or bendamustine at first relapse. Of course, BTK inhibitor like ibritinib, but there are other BTK inhibitor commercially available, are, are probably very important at first relapse. And there are other works that I didn't show you previously that demonstrate how important it is to receive BTK inhibitor at first relapse and more than that second and third relapse. And the other option, because this is a young patient previously transplanted, is a question of allogenic stem cell transplantation. And I should add CAR T cell too, which is now a day another option that can also be on the, in the discussion. So what about the outcome of the patient based on the mental first trial I showed you previously? So you remind that there are probably two kinds of patients, those who, have a, who experience early relapse versus those who have a late relapse. And here the message was, if the patient has an early progression after transplant, it's probably better to receive a debritinib based therapy or monotherapy, at least to restore a response before to know what we will do after this. The other option is allogenic stem cell transplant. This is one of many publications. There are not so many because there are a few patients, but you know, there, are, there are some publications about allogenic stem cell transplantation in mantis cell lymphoma. And the, the shape of the curve is always pretty much the same with the first uh, of years of toxicities, and then you see a plateau curve. And now that we have also the CAR T cells uh, that can be used, but only if the patient are been previously treated with brutinib, which is the case here. This is his first relapse, and the patient did not receive a BTK inhibitor. So, how would I treat this patient in 2029 today? So, we remind he was 62 years old at diagnosis. He received an IDOS RSE 
induction followed by a notalugus stem cell transplant and a rituximab maintenance. So I will first take a look at the duration of response. If it's an early relapse, I will probably go to a BTK inhibitor and hope to reach a PR or even a PR. And then there will be the question of the allogenic stem cell transplantation. So may I argue not CAR T because you have to be BTK inhibitor refractory before to go to CAR T. So the question might make sense if the patient is only in PR. You may consider that he already received two lines of treatment, including a BTK inhibitor, and that the patient is to eligible for CAR-T, but I don't want to go to that direction, and probably we will discuss this point a little bit later. If the patient has more than two years of response from time of diagnosis, I will probably choose again a BTK inhibitor alone. Banamustin or BAC or RCHOP or VRCAP, is, this is also a relevant option, but the question is how I will treat this patient, and I will probably give this patient a BTK inhibitor, and then I will wait. If, it's, if the patient is in CR, then I will go to an ibrutinib uh, uh, answer progression strategy. If the patient do not reach a PR, maybe the question of allo or CAR T these times will be relevant or another line of chemotherapy. But in both sides, I will probably go to a BTK inhibitor based therapy. And then according to the response, PR or CR, patient will, man I will maintain a BTK inhibitor or not a choice in other options. Well, this is what we do today, and we know that the landscape advances in lymphoma is moving very fast. And there are other clinical options, other clinical trials that I want to discuss here with you. The first thing is we are more and more uh, uh, open to combo and new targeted therapy used in combination. And you're probably aware about the ibrutinib venetoclax combo published on behalf of the name of the AIM trial. It's a New England Journal of Medicine uh, a publication. Patients were treated with both drug, ibrutinib first, and then venetoclax. And the, the result was very impressive. And we did the, including the response, including at, at the molecular level. And this is what is, uh, you can see here on the slide, the patient were all relapsed refractory, received the double, uh, the doublet, ibrutinib plus venetoclax. And this patient reached complete remission at molecular level. And it seems that the P53 status was not that important. And you're probably aware about the ongoing sympathetical trial, which is, comparing ibrutinib versus ibrutinib plus venetoclax for relapsed refractory mental cell lymphoma. Another trial called OASIS have also been published in blood, and this is the work that we published uh, uh, last year. It's ibrutinib plus venetoclax plus obinutuzumab. I will not stay too long about the rationale to use obinutuzumab, but the difference here between the AIM trial and the OASIS trial is that it's we also included newly diagnosed patients and not only relapsed refractory patients. And the result for this newly diagnosed patient with mental cell lymphoma is quite amazing. As you see that all the patients who are mistreated, who have been assessed for MRD, rich MRD negativity after only three cycles of treatment. And among the 15 patients who received ibrutinib venetoclax plus a benutizumab frontline, only one was refractory, and surprisingly, this patient was not TP53 mutated. So maybe that this new kind of combo may abrogate the bad prognostic marker of uh, P53 mutation. And what about CAR-T? I mean, it's not almost impossible not to mention CAR-T, and, and I already mentioned CAR-T in, in the treatment options. The results here published by Michael Wong in the New England Journal of Medicine a year ago are pretty impressive. These are all patients who were BTK uh, previously treated, and you see that their results in terms of complete remission, PFS, and overall survival are very interesting and suggest that there may be a plateau curve in these highly refractory patients who have already received the base kind of treatment therapy you can receive uh, nowadays. So CAR-T is now a clear option, after BTK, in BTK patient who fails the therapy. But there are other options, other new drugs are, called, are currently uh, under uh, in, in clinical trials like BALT1 inhibitor, PI3 kinase inhibitor, B, all the BCL2 inhibitors, bispecific, and there are a lot of different options that can be used, including combinations, which is probably uh, the most important uh, news uh, uh, these last years is the possibility to combine these drugs together and to increase their capacity to bypass the bad prognostic markers like P53 mutation or blastoid variant, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is not only how I will treat today, but 
what will be the future? It's always complicated, but I think the impact of the duration of response will remain a major factor. Probably that the early the patient who relapse early after diagnosis will be eligible to some kind of bridge to go to a CAR-T or the bi-specific. In contrast, those who experience late relapse could be eligible for common free combination, including BTK and not be eligible for CAR T only if they're rich PR, if they're rich CR, they may we may use baby who knows the maintenance energy drive the strategy. So the future is is complex in mental cell and pharma. And I think we can conclude today that the conclusion of today will not be the conclusion of tomorrow. But first, TP53 abnormalities are a bad prognostic marker for sure. The duration of response might be taken into consideration before to take any medical decision, comparing short and long duration of response plus TP53 status. BTK inhibitor is today the, the keystone for, this, for the treatment at first relapse, but it will probably be a major drug frontline. And the future directions, well, it's quite complicated to tell you what will be the future, but I think that BTK will be used frontline and CAR T will be used earlier in the course of the disease. And I hope that in the close future, we'll be able to use ever de drive and maintenance or use preemptive treatment at time of relapse. Thank you very much for your intention. I will be more than happy to answer to all your questions.